All right, I want you to think back to a time, back, 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 a long time ago, before you took Systematics 2. And if I would have come in and said, all right, in the life of Christ, when is Christ most like God? So what would you answer? On the cross. No. Based on what? Based on this. Based on this. Yeah, I'm saying back at a time before you had Systematics 2. Probably to the Transfiguration. Right. All right. Okay. Right. Transfiguration, Resurrection. Ascension. When he's not on Earth. When he's not on Earth. Okay. Yeah. Pre-incarnate. <laughs> All right. Good. So we we tend to operate this way, and in fact, this is kind of um, often illustrated, and this is sort of the um, I'll pick on him. This is kind of the the Max Lucado take on things. Okay. So you know, and you're going to hear this. This is Christmas time, so you're going to go home and hear. Well, I shouldn't say this, but. <laughs> Sometimes people talk this way. Um, some people. Um, so, God is up in heaven, and he's looking down on his earth, and he's thinking, oh, it's a terrible mess down there. We need to do something about this. Time for plan B. You know, that's another issue. And um, <laughs> we'll cover that one later. And um, so we need to do something about this. Yes, Father, we should do something about this. Someone needs to go down there. All right, who's it going to be? So the Father and Son have a discussion. Kind of looking at each other. All right, one, two, <laughs> and then father went with paper, and the son had rock, and off he goes. And so that's how it happened. Actually, of course not. The son is to be incarnate because he's the son. So then the story goes. All right. So the father sends the son. So the son becomes incarnate. And ah, oh, imagine, imagine if you will. And even C.S. Lewis does this. It'd be like you becoming a toy soldier to save the toy soldiers. Right? Lewis does this in mere Christianity. And we say, no, that's not enough. It'd be like, it'd be like you becoming a bird to save birds. No, oh, birds are too nice. It'd be like you becoming an ant to save ants. Oh, can you imagine that? Can you imagine becoming a human, becoming an ant? Say, no, 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 that's not even enough. It'd be like you becoming an amoeba to save amoebas. No, you just get ridiculous. Now, the problem with all of these illustrations is they're dead wrong. They're dead wrong. Because the incarnation does not equal humiliation. And we're going to talk more about this after the break when we come and start doing chemnitz. But the incarnation is not equivalent with humiliation. Because if it was, then the exaltation of Christ would have to have an excarnation where you get rid of the flesh. We don't have that. Incarnation is forever. God has taken a human flesh into the Godhead. So there's nothing inherently evil or demeaning or humiliating about human flesh. That would make the Gnostics correct. Yeah, it definitely takes a shot at the Gnostics. You're right. Now, this is a biggie. But see, this is just the first thing and kind of where you start going with this whole train of thought. So what we have here then is we have the word pre-incarnate, Sarah's. Jesus being really like God when he's not Jesus. <clears throat> and so we have the pre-incarnate word, and then takes this huge step down to become flesh. And that's how we often think about it. Now, in fact, there is a correspondence here because the humiliation is the fact that he is born under woman, you know, of a woman, in the law, under the law, subject to the suffering and the brokenness of the world. So he becomes immediately subject to the brokenness because of the circumstances and the way this goes about. But it's not the flesh that's the problem. It's the where he's living in the world. So they happen corresponding, but there's not the same thing. So then we start thinking about Jesus and the humiliation and the descent lower and lower and lower. And so he's born into poverty and he's born subject to suffering. And then we keep on kind of descending lower and lower, and he grieves, and he suffers loss, and we keep on descending lower and lower, and eventually we get to the very bottom of the pit, and what's down there? The cross itself. Because he's, he's rejected, he's spit upon, he's mocked, he's whipped, and it's just, oh, it's worse and worse, and then finally, the very pit is the cross, and he's suffers condemnation, and he dies. And if we're going to do it, we probably have to put the cross down here somewhere. And you know, it's like as low as you can go. 
And then the exaltation kind of reverses it. So we start, okay, he's resurrected, and he's worshipped by his disciples. And then he ascends in glory, and one day he's coming back in full glory. And so we have a nice kind of down and up again. And there you have the whole trajectory of the incarnation, right? And if we would lay this out to most of our people, they'd say, yep, that's it. That's it. Now, what is Bauckham arguing? The exact opposite. The exact opposite. Bauckham is arguing the exact opposite. Bauckham is saying, if you want to see the exaltation of Jesus, and if you want to see Jesus being the most like God, you look to the cross. This, guys, is astounding. And it should hit you that way. And the fact that most of you read Balcom and thought, oh, that's done. <sighs> now, what's next? And didn't even have a thought to the kind of the, the marvel at what Balcom is doing makes me have my work cut out for me today. Because I want you to be able to say, I can't believe Balcom did that. I can't believe the gospel writers did that. That's incredible. Because that's exactly what's going on here. It's mind-blowing the thesis of Balcom. And we need to be able to see that and appreciate that for all the mind-blowingness that it is. All right? So that's the goal for today. We don't have that much to do because we already got started in this a little bit last time, but we do need to take Balcom through to the end. And that's our goal. Any questions then or comments as we get underway here? Yes? I've seen this in, like, confirmation books, though, like what you just drew. Oh, you have? Oh, yeah. No, really? Yeah, so, I mean, is that, I mean, where did this all start? Was this just from a histor historical perspective? Or, I mean, or is this? Well, I don't know. It just makes sense, you know. And besides, there's in one element, the story that kind of works. Yeah, he suffers, and he's, you know, the, but the whole point is the stopping and saying, what is exaltation? What is it, godness? And that's kind of the whole point. And that's what Bauckham's after here. Remember I said, laid it out last time I said, what he's doing now in the last part of this chapter is he's turning the corner, and instead of saying, does God participate in the divinity, now he's saying, I mean, does Christ participate in the divinity? The answer, yes. Well, now he's asking the question, what do we learn about the divinity from Christ? And that's the whole kind of new twist on this. And the thing that I think is, and so in other words, yeah, it's understandable why people think the way I'm you know, like laying it out. And most people should say, well, yeah. But the whole point Bauckham is saying is, not so fast. What's really going on in Scripture? And that's the thing that's compelling about Bauckham as he makes his case. Okay? All right. Let's press onward then. So we pick this up. Page 36 is where we left off, I believe, or 37 actually. And we were introduced last time to this whole idea of the Isaiah significance. Isaiah's combination of these two words, high and lifted up. And so what's it mean to be high and lifted up? And how these are kind of central terms for God's identity. And you see God being God when he is high and lifted up. You know, the throne room kind of thing. God high and lifted up. So now these are key terms that are going to move forward. Now what Balcom is going to argue then is <coughs> that we see Christological monotheism, Christ's full divinity, and God's reality in Christ. And we're going to see it in three scripture texts he's going to explore. Right? He's going to explore Philippians 2. Because this is the outstanding Pauline Christological exploration, Philippians 2. And then the next thing he's going to look at is the apocalypse, what we like to call Revelation. And he's going to explore that. And he's not going to look at the whole book, but he's going to look at different elements all over the place in Revelation. And then the third thing he's going to look at is Gospel of John. So he's going to explore these Three texts. Now, it's interesting we have Paul and John basically doing this. And that's what you've got going on. But there are elements of this that show up in the synoptics as well. And the other gospel writers pick up on this. So it's not foreign to them. It's just that John is overt about it, is the, is the whole argument he's going to make. Okay? So we're going to press onward then. So we go here to page 37, and he lays this down. These are the three texts we're going to look at. So let's start by looking at Philippians 2. And we're going to ask the question, do we see an intentionality where Christ is being pulled into the divine name and we're actually seeing the divine name being given to Christ. We already talked about that, you know, the name Yahweh being given to, to Jesus. But now we have this um, reference to Isaiah 45 and what Balcom is going to say, St. Paul is not only saying that Jesus gets the divine name, but he's making an intentional move to associate Jesus with what's going on in the Isaiah text of the suffering servant. 
and he makes this reference to bottom of 37 and allusion to Isaiah 45. All right? And allusion is a great word because it gives us some latitude to say, I think there's some intentionality here about some Old Testament references, even though it's not an explicit quote. Or even though the writer doesn't say, as Isaiah the prophet said, but you just kind of have this illusion. When you start preaching more, you will realize how helpful these kinds of things are. You use allusions a lot. They're kind of the, the power of good literary work is using allusions. And we, we can recognize these. This is not to say that this is exhaust the meaning of a text or anything like that, but it is saying there's something going on here where Paul is calling this to mind. And then he lays down the parallel columns for us, or actually kind of we have this, so the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he says, hey, this is straight out of Isaiah 45, where you've got, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, I am the God and there is no other. And what's the point of this? Thesis comes on page 38, just above the halfway mark. The Philippians passage is therefore no unconsidered echo of an Old Testament text, but a claim that it is in the exaltation of Jesus, his identification as Yahweh, in Yahweh's universal sovereignty, that the unique deity of the God of Israel comes to be acknowledged as such by all creation. Now here's what he's just said in so many terms. He's saying the first big point he's going to make about all these texts is that God is known in Christ. This is the first argument he's making. So he's saying Philippians 2 is St. Paul intentionally saying, you know that thing that Isaiah said, I'll talk about in Isaiah 45, that all the nations will acknowledge me to be the Lord. Well, when's that going to happen? Someday. Well, the someday is now. It's in Christ. And that's why St. Paul says, every knee will bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So look, Philippians 2 is the fulfillment of the Isaiah 45 prophecy. It just happened. Jesus shows us God. Okay? Believe it? Evidence is there? I think so. And so the point is, Paul is doing this intentionally. This is the key. In other words, it's not like, wow, I guess Paul did that by accident. Kind of cool how that happened. Coincidence. No, Paul's doing it by intention, deliber deliberately. All right, now we go to the book of Revelation. And here we have this really cool parallel with, again, Isaiah. Well, actually, we got this Isaiah 44 and 48. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. That's the Old Testament. We say, wait a minute, that's the book of Revelation. Exactly. And then notice how this is laid out with John, where, how John does this, where you've got God, Father, says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Christ says, a few verses later, I am the first and the last. Then you've got God says, this is the end of the book, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And then Christ says, a few verses later, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Everything true of the Father, His completeness, is true of the Son. And so we're having the Son included, and we're actually seeing God in His all-pervasive rule in Christ. Summarized here for us, bottom of 39. Uh, once again, deuterohysianic monotheism is interpreted as Christological monotheism. God proves to be not only the first, but also the last, the end, the omega of all things, when his kingdom comes in that coming of Christ towards which the whole book of Revelation is oriented. All right? Got it? So we got Revelation covered. Now we're just clipping right along here. Now we move to John's Gospel. And now things get really interesting. And Balcom shoves all of this data into one little page here on page 40. But if you really unpack what's going on here on page 40, this is a phenomenally important argument and a really cool study. And if you have the time someday, do this with your parishioners. You will blow their minds because this is so cool. Now, here's the key thing. We have this whole setup in John's Gospel. We're well familiar with the I am statements of Jesus. And how many times has that been made into a sermon series? Oh, we'll do the I am's. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right? Cool stuff. Great I am statements of Jesus. He's these things, these nice, powerful metaphors. Well, Bauckham says, sure, nice, powerful metaphors, great. There's something else going on here. 
something really significant. Because Balcom says if you pay attention to the Old Testament text, there are seven times in the Old Testament corpus where you have this specific phrase, I am he, in reference to God's divine identity being revealed to the creation. In Hebrew, ani hu, I am he. And so we have these seven times, and Balcom lists them for you in the footnote on page 40. So you've got Deuteronomy 32, 39, Isaiah 41, Isaiah 43, 10 and 13, Isaiah 46, 4 and 48, and 48, 12, and 52, 6. So there they are, footnote 59, bottom of the page. So we have these seven times. So what he's saying is we have Isaiah has... <coughs> Seven different occasions where you have these, I am, I am he, ani who, which translates into the Septuagint to, ego e me, I am, ego e me, which of course is the, I am the door, ego e me, ego e me. And we already know, you've already, you have been alerted to this by brilliant pastors, that when Jesus says, before Abraham was, ego e me, is loaded. Loaded, because it's calling to mind the Tetragrammaton, it's calling to mind the idea of the Yahweh, the I Am, yes, indeed. But it also calls to mind this list of Deuteronomy and Isaiah of these I Am He's, Ani Hu, Ani Hu, Ani Hu. And in fact, Malcolm even gets more specific, he says, actually, there are, the last couple here have an intensification, Anoki, Anoki Hu. I am, I am he. Really emphatic. So you actually end up with seven plus two emphatics for a grand total of nine. You say, okay, whatever, that's interesting, Old Testament stuff. Now the interesting thing, of course, is how many I am statements are there in John's Gospel? Seven. You've got seven I am statements in John's Gospel, and he lists them for you right in the middle of the page. John 4, 26, 6, 20, 8, 24, 26, 58, 13, 19, 18, 5, 6, and 8. And he even says, in John, there are seven absolute I am sayings, with the seventh repeated twice for the sake of an emphatic climax, thus seven or nine in both cases. So you have seven in John, same thing, plus two, for a grand total of nine. So the cumulative effect is this. You've got this statement, I am Yahweh, I am Yahweh, Ani Hu, Ani Hu. And you've got Jesus saying, Ego e me, Ego e me, Ego e me. Exact parallel. So the fulfillment of God's plan prophesied in the Old Testament is bringing brought to completion in Jesus, in the New Testament, and the point that Balcom is making is this is not coincidence. This is intentional. And if this doesn't get you kind of like thinking, you're kidding me. You're not paying attention. Think about what is being suggested here. In other words, so John just kind of writes his gospel, you know, things just kind of come together. No! This is a carefully crafted, constructed, and, you know, literary work, and John is laying it all out for a reason, and it's happening and taking shape and pushing forward with a uh, purpose. It's not just by chance. So you say, what, you mean so like, John's making that up, you know, for his purpose? No, Jesus said it. And so was Jesus actually doing the 7 plus 2 to fulfill the Isaiah? Maybe. Or maybe Jesus said 12 or 13 I am's, but John said, you know, for the purpose of my gospel, I'm going to use these 7 plus 2 because this would really click, and it's going to be really rock and cool. And that's what I'm going to do. So it really doesn't matter how it plays out. The point is John does it. And John's doing this as an inspired writer of Scripture, so that means it's the Holy Spirit doing it. And this just goes to the whole point of these gospels are not kind of sloppily thrown together. They're not the work of these uneducated Galilean fishermen. These are powerful masterful rhetorical pieces that are meant to be very persuasive to the readers. And the argument Bakum will make is the readers would have caught it because in the first century, they were a little more tuned into the Old Testament than we tend to be, and they would have picked up on this. And be that as the case, Bakum has made it, so now you can pick up on it. So there you have this whole thing. So at the bottom of the page 40, he writes, this means that he, Jesus, is the revelation of that unique identity of God to the world. 
So far from the inclusion of Jesus in divinity constituting a problem for monotheism, these new tier writers present it as the way in which the unique God demonstrates his unique divinity to the world. So in other words, the monotheism of Jesus and of God is no, and kind of find a place for Jesus in there is not an issue at all. In fact, Jesus is proving God's unique identity. So not only is it not hurting it, but it's actually pushing it forward. That's the point. All right, you guys are just thrilled to pieces. I can see that. That's great. Good. We're having a great impact on you here. You're really persuaded by this argument. Oh, okay. So you don't even need to worry about it anymore? Okay, good. <laughs> good. So now we have round two. Maybe this will make it better. So round two, now Balcom says, all right, let's ask the next question. Perhaps not only are we saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of these prophecies and bringing them to completion, but actually in Christ we see something about God's very nature being revealed. And so now Balcom goes back to the three texts, Philippians 2, the Apocalypse, and John, and looks at them again and says, now what do these tell us about God's very being? And what do we learn? And so now we're going to do the second run with the second question, which is God's being or the identity of God, the character of God. What's God like? <coughs> and what do we learn from this? So we go to 41, and we have the Philippians text. And the upshot of this is pretty straightforward. If you actually look at this text and put them side-by-side -side columns, which is what Balcom does on page 43, you can be, begin to see not only is Paul echoing Isaiah 45, he's also intentionally following Isaiah 52. So we got, because he poured himself out to death, therefore he shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. There's that exalted and lifted up. In the Isaiah text, you've got the suffering servant who is being exalted and lifted up because he poured himself out to death. And then this is exactly the move that Paul makes in Philippians 2. And being found in human form, he humiliated himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, also God exalted him to the highest place. And the key then for this go around, for the Philippians text, is the therefore. So, why is Jesus exalted and lifted up? Because he suffered. Because he died. It's because he suffered and died, that's why he's exalted. That's why he's honored. So the suffering is the, is the prerequisite, if you will. This is what he's getting at here. So he pours himself out to death, which is heavy sacrificial language, as Dr. Nagel taught us. And he's pouring himself out to death, and it's precisely in the pouring out that now God is recognizing him as being the faithful son. So here we have page 45. Actually picking up bottom of 44. This is not the contrast of two natures, divine and human, but a contrast more powerful for the first century Jewish theology with its controlling image of God as the universal emperor high on his heavenly throne inconceivably exalted above all he has created in rules. Can the cross of Jesus Christ actually be included in the identity of this God? Can the Lord also be the servant? The passage, inspired both by Deutero Isaiah and by the Christ event, answers only the servant can also be the Lord. So not only is the question answered, yeah, the cross can be included, it's precisely only in the cross can you have the Lord present. The suffering is mandatory. Must be. This is the point. So now we go down the next paragraph. Since the exalted Christ is first the humiliated Christ, since indeed it is because of his self-abdignation that he is exalted, his humiliation belongs to the identity of God as truly as his exaltation does. The identity of God, who God is, is revealed as much in self-abasement and service as it is in exaltation and rule. So, <coughs> when is God being most God in Christ? When he is suffering for the sake of his creatures. When he is being humbled and humiliating himself for the sake of the redemption of his creation. That's, that's when he's being the most God. 
because that's when he's revealing God and his godness. And what Bauckham is going to argue then is, this is not some kind of a new weird thing, well, oh, God would do that, but God always gives of himself for the sake of his creation, but we now see it happening supremely in Christ. And so St. Paul makes the connection that the exaltation of Christ happens precisely because he suffers and is shamed and is crucified. It's the cross that brings the glory. And that's where we start saying, wow, that's kind of um, counterintuitive. Because we usually think about the cross, shame, oh yeah, the shame of the cross, that's horrible. And yet that's precisely where the glory comes. No cross, no shame. All right? So that's the Philippians text. Pretty straightforward. Now we move to the book of Revelation. And this happens pretty quickly. He devotes barely a page to this. And the key text in this time is Revelation 5.13. Revelation 5 <laughs> is one of, those, um, <clears throat> one of those glimpses into the throne room of eternity, a throne room of heaven, where you've got God in his glory. But in 5.13, what do you have in Revelation? You've got the Lamb on the throne. And what's significant about the Lamb? Having been slain. Lamb having been slain. Or even the word is even stronger. Bakken translates it slaughtered. Yeah, a slaughtered lamb, which means the one who's gone through the sacrifice. The slaughtered lamb. So the slaughtered lamb is on the throne. This is pretty cool. This runs parallel with the gospel appearances of Christ. Remember when Thomas stands before Christ? Or actually tells his brothers, unless I stick my fingers in the nail marks and thrust my hand in the side, I won't believe. And then Jesus shows up, and what's he got? He's got the nail marks. Now, you would think, you would think that if God was going to resurrect his son and give him a glorified body, he could get him healed up by the time the disciples saw him. So what's with this? He needs a few more weeks to, uh, with hands to get it all the way healed up? You think about that. Why are the marks still there? The whole point is, that's the glory. He is in a glorified body, and in the glorified body, the marks are present. So Thomas can stick his fingers in the nail marks because they're still there. And will be. That's the point of the lamb on the throne as a lamb having been slaughtered. The evidence of the slaughter is still present. It's not gone. And so we're still seeing the slaughtered lamb, the sacrificial lamb, Christ giving of himself for the sake of the creation. That holds. It's still in place. It's still at work. Okay? Everybody tracking here? So what we're getting then is the slaughtered lamb is glorified. And it's receiving all the praise and all the honor. And again, the slaughter becomes a necessary element of this. All right? Yeah? So even, because I have often heard that <coughs> after Christ's resurrection, that he has to receive his glorified body. And that's why he could come in and out of rooms without going through doors and stuff. So it happens even before. Well, he hasn't received his glorified body? But well, that he has his glorified body oh, after yeah. the resurrection. That's why he go in and out of rooms yeah, and yeah, yeah. doors and stuff like that. Even that's his God. Right. <laughs> but you can do it prior to that point, or there's no recorded incident of that happening. He could have. So his glorified body actually, well, yeah, after all, he did walk on water. Yeah, he did. <laughs> so, so then he actually received his glorified body at the cross, then not not after resurrection. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what we see here, or no? Okay. No. What. Well, um, we'll talk about this more with Chemnitz, but um, Gainus Myostaticum would say that the human body participates fully in the divine attributes from the moment of the incarnation. Mm -hmm. It's just that he's not using them all the time. But he, Jesus could have always done all those things. He just didn't. He chose not to. And so the glorified body is that there's some kind of shift in the um, reality of his body after the resurrection, which we will also experience. But it's not like, wow, now he gets to go through doors, and someday we will too. No, I think the um, going through doors is purely because he's God, not because he's glorified. So, sorry. Sorry. I don't think you'll get to. You know, just like I don't think you'll get wings in eternity. Sorry about that one. You'll be stuck, you know, flying with the birds on their backs if necessary. 
Um, but um, yeah, I know that's a tough break. I mean, dreaming otherwise. Um, so I guess that's what I would say to that. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'll get to this later too in Kevin's foot. What about when he's at the tomb and Mary sees him and Christ says he can't? Yeah, I'm not yet returned to my father. Right. Yeah, that's one of those, one of those enigmatic t texts, and people say, oh, no one, what's he talking about? No one's really sure. Um, the best um, exegesis I've heard is that Christ used, actually says to her, stop hanging on to me, um, and it's uh, present. So it's not an, a, not an a, uh, heiress. So it's not a, don't, don't, don't touch me. It's um, quit, quit grabbing, quit, cl quit clinging to me. Yeah, quit, quit holding on. And essentially what he's trying to communicate to her is things are going to be a little different now. And if there's a there's a sermon for you, you know that the women come to the tomb looking for a dead Jesus, and even when he appears to them resurrected, they're not sure if they want him that way yet. They want him the old way, and they're not ready for what he wants to bring. So there's there's your first Easter sermon. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs>